two summers ago, my 10-year-old brother, Brendan, and I flew to another country to play a video game. Ridiculous, I know. Many of you may be familiar with the video game Pokemon, but competitive Pokemon is a completely different story. When I picked up my first Pokemon game, I thought this would just be something I would do with, with friends, and that's basically it. Like, never thought it would turn into what it is today. I would say that I have met some of my best friends in my life through Pokemon, and I think that is something that is super special. It gave me a passion that I was really excited about. To be able to discover that at an early age, I think, was super helpful for me. I remember, like, I used to, like, dream about stuff like this when I was a kid. So fast forward all these years later, and it's still kind of feels like a dream. My name is Aaron Zhang, and I was born in Queens, New York. Growing up, my parents were pretty apprehensive of allowing me to play video games until I was a little bit older. And I did uh, swimming lessons, took piano classes, but never really enjoyed any of those. At the time, like all of my other friends were, you know, playing Pokemon, and I just convinced my parents to buy me a Game Boy. And so my first Pokemon game was actually my very first video game ever. It was Pokemon Emerald, and I got really, really hooked onto it like very quickly. 2006, I went to the Journey Across America tour. It was an event where, you know, it was like a celebration of Pokemon. And Snorlax said, wait a minute, he used a body slam, brother. Back then, they were offering like super rare Pokemon that they would trade via like the link cable. Two of my friends were in line and I wasn't very interested in getting the rare Pokemon, so I went on my own to like explore and check out the other events. And they had this area where they taught like people how to play the trading card game. I learned how to play there at that event, thought it was really cool, went to a trading card game tournament like a year after that and then realized competitive Pokemon was a thing and then it really just took off from there. Events in the old days were like the wild, wild west. There were no chairs, there were best of one single elimination events, and they would draw in really sizable audiences. And back then, there were only so many slots available, so you had to get through a lottery system while you were there in person during the day of the event to actually compete. Oh, no, I'm not gonna... So I went to this video game event just because I you know, thought it was interesting, didn't really think very much of it. And I somehow managed to string a bunch of wins together and ended up finishing, I think, in the final four of that tournament. And they're like, oh, okay, well, we'll fly you out to Orlando, Florida for Worlds. You can go there for like five days and four nights and bring a parent as well. We went down to Orlando and I got knocked out in the first round and that was it. <laughs> and I think the game ended in four turns and I was like, wow, I flew out here to lose in 10 minutes and I was so, so sad. In 2009, I got my brother into competitive Pokemon. Going to events together was really nice. We would talk about strategy or just talk about team compositions and then actually competing in these tournaments. We ended up making a lot of the same friends who we still are friends with to this day. And so having Pokemon was really bonding and like uniting experience. In 2011, Wolfie and I and my brother all won the regional championships in Virginia. Winning that first regionals really started that hunger to like compete at a high level and continue to try to do better and keep winning. The fact my parents were so supportive of it from when I was young really means a lot. In 2008, I was ready to go to my first U.S. national tournament and my flight got canceled. I was just absolutely devastated. My dad just saw how disappointed I was and he said, you know what, I'm gonna drive you to Columbus, Ohio. And we ended up actually making it there just 15 minutes before the tournament started. Uh, and so the fact that he did that, I mean, I can't really express in words like how much it means to me. Growing up, you know, we were definitely not exactly like a very wealthy family. And so we actually never really took family vacations at all. And so I was really grateful that Brendan and I could like take them to some places that I think they'd probably be interested in seeing, but just like normally couldn't justify spending money to go to. And most of our quote unquote family vacations were basically from Pokemon because we would both win travel awards and so both my mom and dad could come. Even if we weren't performing well, I think my parents would have been supportive of it because they saw that it was like something that was really important to us and really means a lot. Especially because if there were like no Pokemon, no video games, I think my life would have gone down a completely different trajectory.
Uh, I'm the two-time national champion for the U.S. I've, right. I won nationals again to get here. All right. Mm -hmm. So you are the man with the target on your back then. The man with the target on the back. In 2012, I ended up getting top eight at the World Championships in the seniors division. I had won regionals, I had won nationals. The only thing left was basically like win worlds. And I know that's a really difficult task, but going into Masters in 2013, I felt really, really confident in my abilities that year. Back then, you had to be top 12 in the US in championship points to qualify into Worlds. And the first tournament I competed in in Masters was like Philadelphia Regionals in 2013, and I ended up making it all the way to the finals of that tournament. I ended up losing 1-2, I believe, but I felt like definitely could have been good enough to win the event. And then I ended up winning this Regionals in Massachusetts. That was like a really, really meaningful victory for me. I played a lot of good players at that event as well, so I think that instilled a lot of confidence in me. And then I ended up getting top 16 at US Nationals that year. And my top 16 set was definitely one in which like I misplayed, but also probably like one of the unluckiest sets I've had that year. That year was frustrating because I felt like I was good enough to win nationals and because I actually knew the exact team my opponent had in top 16. It was the exact team I'd given Brendan to play in that event with. But I did pretty well. And so I think I had a lot of motivation going into Worlds. The circuit back then was pretty wild because there wasn't a day one, day two. It was just kind of a one day event all the way until finals. Six Swiss rounds total and top eight made it through. And I actually lost round two and that just made the climb so much more difficult, right? Because when you lose round two, you basically have to win out at that point. But I managed to string together four wins in a row. Good. The adrenaline at EVF from winning these matches felt so amazing, especially because you're competing against the best in the world. Top 8 of Worlds 2013 was like a really, really close three-game set, and before I had uh, gone up for my top four set, uh, Brendan had actually made it to the finals in juniors. I was just so happy from that moment, like, I didn't realize just how close I was to making it to the finals of Worlds and maybe even being world champion. All right, everybody, welcome back to the 2013 Pokemon Video Game World Championships as we are headed into our first game, Ryosuke Kosude from Japan up against Aaron Zhang from the United States of America. One, I felt like I had a really good early advantage and that it would be really difficult for him to come back, but I remember the ending of that game because there was a scenario where like his out was to like get a double protect off with Heatran. Getting the protect oh. a little bit better. And we do get another protect off from Ryosuke's Heatran as the Ice Punch comes out from Conkelder onto the Cresselia, not taking the bait there. That was super hype. I remember I was like, you know, like hyping up the crowd, but I generally felt good about my game state there. Ryosuke sends out his double genies the classic that he used to take game two from Sage and Park. I think the adjustment was the right one on his end to make, right? And I think, you know, with Swagger and Thunderwave being a lot stronger back then, unfortunately there wasn't like a definitive counter. Uh-oh. And here's where things get dicey for Aaron. The Swagger coming out onto Cresselia now that it's both par paralyzed and confused, its chances of attacking are drastically reduced now. Frustrating for sure, but I think in those situations, what I remind myself is, hey, like, I win the majority of the time if this doesn't happen. So if I just keep playing my game, then odds are that I, I should win, right? Uh, but it is going to try for another Will-O-Wisp. Will it hit? No, of course not. <laughs> of course Rotom is not going to hit with that Will-O-Wisp. As the confused and paralyzed Cresselia is unable to make a move either. That frustrating turn for Aaron there. Frustrating just, game. Just, Weirdly it. enough, I wasn't super tilted even after the game was over because once again, it was just excitement from being there. But now I look back and I'm like, if I were not having to be again, I would be so, so upset. If I'm Aaron, I'm thinking, I've got to find a better way to control Thunderous. I can't let him paralyze all of my important Pokemon. I can't let him just swagger my special attackers. Look. Going into team preview in game three, I was really literally hovering between Landorus and Tranfer. Like I was literally going back and forth and back and forth. And in the end, I ended up going with Landorus. And the 
Confusion coming out for Rotom. And the Paralysis, will it be able to get its off? Yes! Hydro Pump does go through the Confusion and the Paralysis, and it hits onto that Heatran. All of the odds stacked against Rotom. It finally makes up for all five of those Will-O-Wisp miss. <laughs> And it gets the Hydro Pump onto that heat trend, uses Eruption. The odds of that are actually pretty slim, right? So I had situations where I got a little lucky as well. Another attack off, confused, paralyzed, gets the Hydro Pump off, and it connects! At that point, his team was relatively low HP, so I thought uh, the combination for Selly and Kelder under Trick Room could sweep. And that turn, I believe, I went for Rock Slide with the Landorus and then Trick Room with Cresselia. I felt like I had the game literally in my hands. I thought I had it won, honestly. And Swagger comes out from Funduras is going to swagger that Landorus really going to toss the dice, really playing with fire here. I was like, oh my god, I did not even consider this as a possibility, but I probably just win the game right there if Rock Slide connects. No! It hits itself in its confusion! and it deals 61 damage to itself. It also breaks its Focus Sash as Cresselia's Ice Beam is going to be able to get the knockout onto Landorus. Really unfortunate break for Aaron there. I didn't really think about the possibility that it would just be completely lost in one turn, but it went from what felt like a near guaranteed win to a near guaranteed loss, basically. And the Paralysis, just going to be just going to be gravy there for Ryosuke as... I think that one really stings because, yes, I you know did get pretty unlucky, but I didn't do a very good job like knocking out Thunderous, uh, and I think I generally let it stay on the field for longer than I really should have. Obviously, I'm very grateful to have you know had that good run, but now I look back, and of course, I can be like, you know, that was like the best chance I had at winning Worlds, and I, I just felt like short. If he can find a way to knock out Scissor, who's burned and slowly its health is going down, he will become the world champion. He's been working at this for years. Two top four finishes in the last two years. This could finally be his year. The X Scissor comes out onto Scizor. It's going to deal an, not enough damage for the KO, but the burn damage will be enough. And Scizor is going to fade. And Brendan Zhang of the United States of America will defeat Fuko Nakamichi and become our 2013 World Champion in the Junior Division. Congratulations, Brendan. Seeing my brother win, I was truly just so genuinely happy, especially because Brendan had even gotten closer to winning Worlds than I had before. And it was so meaningful. It was his last year in the Juniors Division. He was playing at such a like phenomenal level that event. And overall, like he played incredibly in that finals as well. What do, I, I, have to, I have to ask, what is your uh, record against your brother? I don't know, like I win all the time, so. <laughs> Spoken like a true champion. <laughs> in, class, in my eyes, I often saw a lot of his success as like, I had done something right. And I'm just so happy that like, I could get him into the game and now he's like taking it to a point where he's more champion. Hey guys, Aaron Cybertron Saint here and today I'm bringing you a new series on my YouTube channel. So today's video, or series really, is going to be me battling on the VGC 14 ladder, uh, special rated battles, uh, and just providing live commentary as I go. After Worlds in 2013, I was like, you know what, I feel like this would be a good time to explore making some content. I got my brother into playing Pokemon and now he's a world champion, so maybe if I can introduce other people, if they can have that you know, same path one day. In only two months and hitting 10,000 subscribers is really awesome. I reached over 20,000 subscribers earlier today, with 30,000 subscribers this past week. When I started making videos, I was expecting like 10 people to watch them. For me, even getting like a thousand views or a thousand subscribers was like mind blowing. Well, Sylveon hangs up with one HP, can it wake up? <laughs> I was just so happy that people were watching and like happy with content that I was making. Putting yourself out there in the world in general can be difficult and you never know how people will receive what you're doing and so to generally get good reception and good feedback I think really meant a lot to me. I think that gave me confidence to continue and to make content that I would hope my viewers would enjoy. Since my brother and I did well enough in 2013, we were automatically invited to next year's World Championships. This meant we didn't have to take the qualifying tournaments throughout the season as seriously. The lack of practice and dedication was really, really showing though. 
I performed far below standard at the tournaments I did attend. Crazy enough, I was washed up by age 17. <laughs> you know, I definitely lost some confidence in my ability to perform and I like, couldn't really pinpoint the specific reason, whether it be motivation or lack of practice, for example. Uh, kind of humbling experience realizing like you're not always going to perform at the highest level of the game and so being comfortable with losing was something I needed to like really learn especially earlier on in my career when I just like hated losing even a single practice game. Last season felt like a reality check to me because I wasn't performing nearly as well as I used to and I want to be a bit honest with you guys. When I started making YouTube videos around you know February of last year I didn't know how much time I had competing at this game at the highest level. I think the main thing that was tough was in 2014, like I was still in high school and I like went to a very competitive high school where everyone was focused on college admissions and I was just there making Pokemon videos like every day and my grades definitely took a, took a hit from me making videos and competing uh, so much and I was like asking myself should I be spending all this time like doing Pokemon stuff when I, I have like the last two years of high school in front of me. This year, I really had no idea what to expect. I had no idea how well I'd perform. I, you know, I knew I would try my hardest, uh, but ultimately what came down to it was the encouragement and support that you guys gave me. I, I think that year was overall difficult, but then it gave me the motivation I needed to get to compete well in 2015. And then 15 was also probably like one of the best years I had in terms of performances in my career. Uh, you guys will are continue to uh, motivate me to con uh, compete at the highest level at these competitions. And you guys are the reason why I want to do well. In the end, it ended up working out and I'm very grateful because because like Pokemon was actually such a key component to my college application. And fast forward to 2016. Nintendo actually invited me to E3 to be part of their Pokemon segment. Is Pokemon Go going to be like the main series where there's some Pokemon that are significantly harder and more rare to catch? It made me feel really proud of like the work I put in and everything that I had done in the space and it made me so happy that like even though maybe I'm not like the most well-known player or creator or, or YouTuber or whatever, like they specifically had me on their list to, to invite. Uh, thank you to Niantic and Pokemon for having me here and I'm really excited to see the future of it. I like truly think that so much of what I've been able to accomplish is only possible because of everyone that's like supported me. And for that, I am forever grateful and thankful. So thank you guys. It really means the world to me. Um, and that's basically all I wanted to say. Welcome back, Pokemon fans, to the 2016 Pokemon Video Game National Championships. My name is Dweeha, and joining me on the stage is a player that needs no introduction at all, Aaron Cybertron Zhang. Aaron, how does it feel to be here? It's weird being on the other side, Dwee, but <laughs> I'm really excited, and we've already seen some pretty great stuff, so I'm oh, looking yeah. forward to casting a bunch of games with you. you. You get used to it. Chris Bowen over at Pokemon like actually reached out to me. He was like, hey, uh, we have a spot open for our team. I was like, oh shoot, like this is awesome. And I just knew that like my head wasn't fully in the game. So I figured it would be like the perfect opportunity to try commentating. Hey guys, Aaron Weatherman Zhang here. And today I'm bringing you some top analysis. <laughs> they're both phenomenal players. I mean, you can see why they're regional champions, why uh, they've been heralded as you know such great players in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not like those 2012, 2013 Cresselias that had choice specs, expert belt, life orb occasionally, but. Uh, One of the reasons I wanted to get into casting was because I played the game for so long and I know so many people, I know the stories of the players and really the history of the scene. And so to be able to convey that, I think in casting is really, really exciting. Being able to work with a lot of like the commentators and friends that I've like respected for so long, I think was super cool as well. And here's the water spout. Wolfie Glick is your 2016 Pokemon video game world champion in the Masters Division. You know, being able to add value to when people watch like a stream or a match, I think is really fun. I really like to be energetic and hopefully make it a more enjoyable viewing experience for everyone at home. Welcome fans and trainers from all over Australia and around the world. It's nice to have finally made it to Sydney. Yeah. The fact that there are these really cool major events in these awesome cities around the world, right? Whether it be Melbourne, Australia, or Sao Paulo, Brazil. These are places that I never would have imagined traveling to. And if you told me when I was a kid, yeah, one day you'll get paid to like commentate video game uh, events around the world. I, I would tell you like, you know, you're lying, but here, here we are. Needle Queen might just be uh, the ace that Brendan needs to seal up this game. It's going to be so close, but it all comes down to this one final turn. You know, I know that I will be doing it for forever. So I'm just really blessed. I feel like that those opportunities were on the table. When I picked up my first Pokemon game, I thought this would just be something I would do with, with friends, and that's basically it. Like, never thought it would turn into what it is today. 
traveled to so many different countries and really even continents through Pokemon and I've met a lot of really great people that have shaped me to who I am today. I would say that I have met some of my best friends in my life through Pokemon and I've known these people for over a decade at this point. People like Wolf uh, and Aaron Trill are still some of my best friends to this day. In terms of the future, really hoping that we can get more people competing. It makes me feel super good when I know that I could be a part of someone's like competitive journey. I could get them into competitive Pokemon and now they're a regional or national champion. Competitive Pokemon gave me an outlet for competition that I otherwise like wouldn't have had and it was like such an instrumental part of my childhood and development that you know, I want as many people in the world to experience it as possible. Am I actually going to be a world champion? I, I can't say for sure, but I know what it takes to like get to that level basically and so I can at least like say I'm going to work towards putting in that effort. But if it's not the most realistic goal, it's always one that I'll have in the back of my mind. Pokemon taught me a lot. It taught me to look at both victory and defeat with an open mind. To laugh a little bit more, even when things don't necessarily go my way. It taught me to explore my passions fully and to cherish the friendships that come to life through them. To love what I do and to be proud of it. Pokemon taught me joy. I hope your passions and your friends do the same for you. Thank you. I, when I was younger, I needed to, you know, pick a username, and I had just watched the Transformers movie, and I just thought Cybertron sounded really cool, so that's literally it. And I, I think, uh, I initially wanted to start with the username Megatron, but that was already taken on, uh, like, whatever forum I was signing up for, so Cybertron actually became, like, the, the next thing.